Thank you, Ryan. Hi, everyone. Yeah, uh, my name's Dan. I lead the Identity and Infrastructure Engineering team at Just Eat. A uh, bit of a tongue twister. Thankfully, we're just uh, IIE internally, which makes things a bit easier. Um, how many people here are Just Eat customers? A few of you. Good, good. Over half. That's brilliant. So, for those of you who haven't heard of us, um, we're one of the, le the leading global marketplace for online food delivery. Um, so through our online platform, we connect uh, over 21.5 million hungry customers with over 82,000 different restaurant partners. That could be anything from your local Chinese to a uh, branded restaurant group in the UK, such as Pizza Express. Um, we processed 136 million orders in 2016. That number's just going upwards. Um, around the world, we have 2,900 employees currently. Uh, back at the end of 2014, uh, that was 1,500. So we're growing really quickly, at adding approximately 465-ish new roles each year, uh, in addition to the, the usual kind of churn of starters and levers and changes that you'd expect. So it's great to be growing quickly. It does give us a few challenges, however, when it comes to managing the identities for all those people. We, we think within tech, we're quite a special place to work. You know, there's a load, a load of stats up there around um, the, the Just Eat platform. We're a big Amazon customer. Um, but more importantly, there's 500 plus people who currently work in tech across our locations. And we have a career ladder that em emphasizes the ability to move between roles and, and streams. Um, so so you, you might have someone who's a software developer that then goes off into product development, um, you might have an engineer that becomes a team leader or vice versa. So we, we need to make sure that we put some really good security around that process so that people only have access to the information that they actually need in order to, in order to, to do their current role. Uh, so the identity and infrastructure engineering team, my, my, my team, it's, it's a slightly, maybe not completely usual combination of, of practices. So I just wanted to tell you a bit about what we actually do. So on one side, we have identity and access management responsibility. So in that space, we use uh, the, the complete Microsoft tool set, a lot, a lot of the things that Brandon was just talking about, we, we currently make use of with Azure AD. Uh, we link into Workday, which is our HR system. The, the other side of what we do is the enterprise infrastructure and DevOps tooling. So here we have a much kind of wider range of systems that we look after. Uh, everything from Google G Suite through to Atlassian, GitHub, all of the major cloud providers. Um, we think it's quite a good combination of practices to have identity management and, and the team that supports those services put together, um, because it means that we get to put identity access management up front and center when it comes to deploying those applications. It's not a bolt on later, it's something that is thought about um, and included, it, included when we deploy these things. So as I said, we, um, we, you know, we, we have some challenges around our identity management. We've been working with the identity experts to, to resolve some of these over the last few months. Um, five, five main areas that we're looking to address. So, so the first one is that up until the latter half of last year, we didn't have a single source of truth for staff data. So what I mean by that is that we had some users who were in our HR system. Um, that wasn't giving us global coverage. So there's some, some business units and different countries where users were just in Active Directory. We had uh, pe people filling in starter forms and the data wasn't always the same between Active Directory and HR. I'm seeing a few smiles across the rooms, not just me. Um, so you know that, that, that led to quite a fragmented process sometimes where people's names would be wrong and they'd have to correct it when they arrived or um, you pe know, people might leave and not necessarily all of their access was revoked, which is obviously something that we really want to avoid doing. Um, also, as, as we had those different roles moving around the business that I talked about, people tend to accumulate access rights. So it's very unusual that, that the, the access rights disappear over time. It, people accumulate access to, to data and to systems. Uh, we use a lot of cloud systems, as, as a lot of organizations do, so a lot of SaaS services. Again, as Brendan talked about, they have their own user directories that we need to try and keep in sync with Active Directory in our case. Um, th th the reason for doing that is not just around security, it's also around good license management. We don't want to have licenses assigned to users that no longer need to use a system. Those manual processes that we have were kind of, kind of put in place when Just Eat was a small organization. They're not necessarily scaling with the, 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 the same scale as the company's growing. Um, 
so it's taking us a large amount of time in, in our end user support team um, over 3,000 hours last year to, to, to sort out the, the, the manual processes and do all the auditing of access rights and so on that we have to have because we can't rely on the manual process to always successfully um, run through. There's, there's you know, of, often missing information or manual processes will result in human error. It's kind of inevitable. GDPR, yeah, we'll talk about that. May the 25th is coming up. Um, so our, our internal um, GDPR team have, have made it quite clear to us that all of the same uh, controls that are going in, in place for customer data also apply to personal data about employees. So the, the, the data that we hold on a person, whether that's a customer or a member of staff, must be accurate. Uh, that's one of the main ones that we're taking from that. And also the access controls must be in place to restrict access to personal data. It's, it's not you know, n n nothing particularly revolutionary, but, but it's something that we're able to address through some of the work that we're doing um, with our identity programs. So, so you, you can view all this kind of in the, in the identity life cycle. So you've got a, a new starter that joins the organization. They have a brand new kind of fresh um, corporate identity. What we want at that stage is to make sure that the onboarding process is as slick and as kind of a, a, a good experience to the user as possible. We've, there's, there's research that shows that the, the better the induction and onboarding process for new member staff, the more likely they are to retain for more than three years. So it, you know, it helps us as, a, as an organization and it gives the new starter a really good experience if on their first day, all of the systems and the data that they need access to is available to them automatically. The, as people move and change, as I say, we gradually accumulate those access rights and then by the time they come to leave the organization, whether they're retiring or moving off to another organization, um, it's quite likely that there's a large amount of systems where they need to have access revoked. Um, unless you have some sort of automation around this, it, it's a really manual process to, to do that. So that's the identi identity life cycle. Um, you know, starter, mover, lever. People are probably really aware of that, and, and you probably all have processes in place to, to address, address these different areas. Um, so, so our solution to this is to look at automation of the identity life cycle. We're calling it identity life cycle management internally. And there's five main areas here that we're uh, implementing which allow us to, to automate as much of this process as possible. So the, uh, I'll talk about these in a bit more detail. So just a summary that the first one is the synchronization of data between Workday and Active Directory. So we're using on-premise AD and we're using Azure AD and AD Connect as kind of the glue between our cloud systems and on-premise active directory. Um, so that means that AD accounts are now automatically created from Workday when someone enters the new starter process within, within Workday. We're then implementing a workflow tool, and again, the ID experts have been really helpful here to, to help us to get this all configured, which is uh, Microsoft Identity Manager. So, that's a tool that comes with our EMS licenses and it allows us to do the kind of uh, automation of the, of the manual process that's not covered by the Azure AD connectors. So a, a lot of the steps that our end user support team currently do manually, we're, we're working off into, into MIM workflows and rules. Uh, a key thing that we're doing is around access, um, uh, changing it from access based on who you are to what role you have. So we're implementing roles um, based on the role information that's coming out of Workday, and we're then making sure that the security is assigned to roles, not to people, which means as people move roles, um, the, the, the security associated with that role is automatically changed. Uh, provisioning and deprovisioning, again, is a key thing for us, so making sure that our SaaS systems have uh, fewer stale accounts and that we're linking in that into Active Directory as, as much as possible. And finally, um, We've been implementing this for a while, but it, it forms quite a key part of the overall automation process, which is single sign-on. So in the majority of cases for this, we're actually using Active Directory Federation services rather than native Azure AD sign-on. Um, and what that results in is a reduction in the, the manual administration that we have had to do previously in setting up user accounts on those systems, and also improved security. Once you disable an AD account, access is revoked in, in all the systems that are SSO with it. So that, that's kind of fa fairly, fairly common, common technology that we're using for that. Um, but we've, we found that the more widely you can roll out a single sign-on, the, the kind of greater the benefits are, particularly when put in conjunction with the rest of the automation that we're putting in. 
So I've got a few slides now which just take us through kind of how these things actually work in a little bit more detail. Um, so the first one is data synchronization. So here we have Workday is, as our HR system, our kind of master record of truth for identity within the organization. Um, using Azure AD, so we, we, we're using the Azure AD Workday connector. Um, data is kind of sucked out of Workday, whether that is the kind of standard stuff you might expect, like you know, first name, last name, also some more specific uh, just the information such as whether they're on the insider list, their cost code, their division, team, department, all those different things are written into AD, Azure AD attributes. Um, using Azure AD Connect, that's then written back to our on-premises AD where we can um, take advantage of, of that information that's been added to the AD accounts. So it means w <coughs> when we're doing kind of scripting for, for things, we, we can make use of those attributes and also we use them within the workflows. So MIM is our primary tool for workflow, as I mentioned. Uh, we have two, two way synchronization, so data is kind of pulled out of Active Directory into MIM. It sits within the MIM database um, called the Metaverse. Um, and we then have workflows that automate a number of common areas that our end user support team would previously have had to have done manually. So one of those would be group membership, so making sure that um, someone is added into distribution lists for their area, for example, security groups associated with the applications that they need, and also um, our roles within, a, within Active Directory that I talked about are, are based on groups as well. So MIM will put them all into the groups based on that data that comes from Workday. Uh, we manipulate some of the attributes that come out as well. So, so for example, our job title field within AD is a combination of the person's job title from Workday with a comma, and then their team. So, so we can put that all together so we get a, a, a nice consistent user experience for everyone so that everyone knows what they do and which part of the business they work in. Uh, and we also can move objects around within MIM. So for example, putting someone in, into the correct um, OU for their country, you know, based, based on where they work from Workday. That's all then synchronized back into Active Directory on-premise. Some attributes will also flow back into Workday. So, so a good example of that would be email address. So wh when you've got a, a person going through the onboarding process, they will generally sign up with their personal email address. Um, yeah, so so they, they can do all their, uh, kind of e-sign their contract and all that good stuff. Um, what, what we want on their first day is for that to switch over to their corporate identity so they can single sign on into Workday. So, so that email address gets written back in um, via Azure AD again. So Azure AD is kind of the glue between the systems and our hybrid infrastructure back into Workday. Um, Role-based access is the other key thing that we've implemented. So I've just given an example here of how it works with the classic adding a user to a file share. Most people that worked in IT hopefully have some experience of this, or your team certainly will. Um, so the top part of the slide is, is how this would have traditionally have worked. So Joe Bloggs um, gets a new role within the company. Uh, all IT would probably have seen of that is an access request saying, hey, please can I have access to folder B? Um, that might have been signed off by his line manager or some other approval process. But ultimately, you don't have the information that says, actually, I no longer need access to folder A, just to folder B. Um, so Joe ends up with access to both folders, even though in his new role, he only needs access to the second one. So with role groups, which is what we're currently working on um, introducing throughout the organization, um, rather than Joe having to request access to folder B, Workday automatically tells us that he's moved into a, di a different role. And via the, one of the change workflows, uh, Joe, Joe Bloggs is then put into the relevant Active Directory group that represents his new role. That group already has access to folder B, so there's no setup. But importantly, it doesn't have access to folder A. Fred Bloggs comes along, joins the organization. He gets put into, the, into Joe's original role. And because that group already has access to folder A, on day one, he's ready to go. So it, it's been quite a process for us to get all these, all these roles kind of defined. We're, we're going through what we're calling a blueprinting process right now. So, so we're, it's, it's basically a template that tells um, line managers what each role has access to within their team. And we're getting that all signed off and doing some sanity checking to make sure that roles um, only have access to the, the kind of systems and data that they need to. 
that's particularly relevant in like our call center, for example, and, and other areas where we want to make sure that access to personal customer data is restricted as much as possible. Um, but it's, it's a lot easier when, when you, you don't have the whole, I'll oh, just copy access rights from person C when I, when I join, because that's, that, you know, that's, that's what that person does. Um, so it's, it's a, much, a much kind of more secure method of, of managing that. Provisioning and deprovisioning is a key thing for us as well. So I'll give an example here of how it works with Salesforce, um, just, just kind of in case you're not aware of how it works in practice. So um, it's all driven via our, our on-premise AD again. Um, so someone will get added to, a, say, the Salesforce admin user group within AD. That's picked up by Azure AD using AD Connect. Um, and the Salesforce connector within Azure will, will then be able to read um, that group membership change, create the relevant Salesforce user, assign the license, and also assign the person to the right role within Salesforce. Deprovisioning, pretty similar, except that this time someone's removed from the group and it removes that permission again. So we, we use single sign-on for Salesforce already, um, so it's not so much of a security improvement, but it's, it's, a, it's a massive help around uh, license management. So we, we, we don't want to have stale accounts hanging around. Um, even if they can no longer sign in, we'd rather still only have the correct people within the system that actually ha should have access to that system. Um, it also helps us on our audits. You know, it's quite hard to explain to the auditors that yes, these 100 people have still got accounts, but they can't log in because they haven't got an account over here. So it's much better to have just the correct list of names in the system in the first place. Um, single sign-on, so we use ADFS for this. Um, again, just to kind of simplify the overview of how it works. So, so we, again, we use the application launcher uh, that Brandon showed you earlier. Uh, we call it MyApps. Um, I'm not sure if Microsoft have renamed it since then, but, <laughs> but hey. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a really helpful um, portal anyway. So, so we, 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 give, we give the users all of the links they need to access the systems that they need for their day-to-day -day work, all in one place. Um, without having to set up bookmarks and email links around and that kind of stuff. When a user clicks on a link, we can take them straight to the SSO flow for a particular application. Um, that uses our ADFS infrastructure, the proxy servers facing the internet, so we don't have to expose our domain controls directly to the internet. Um, authenticates the user against our internal AD uh, and returns that kind of logon token to the, to the application that's calling. Um, claim information is, is pretty key as well to this, so uh, as well as just the authentication token, we can return some extra information about the user that is relevant to, that, to the application that's calling it. Um, and we can also manipulate the information that comes out of AD to, to suit the format that's required by the calling application. So let's say that Salesforce requires usernames in the format like first initial dot last name. Our internal usernames are, are based on the whole name. So using um, using the kind of claim manipulation that's built into ADFS, we can, we can format the data so it's all, all correct when it goes out to the external system to make the process as seamless as possible. So here's kind of an example of how the whole automation works. We're, we're, we're currently focused on the starter process, which is why a lot of this is about the new starter. So um, we have a new Salesforce admin appointed within Workday. So they go, they go through their onboarding process, and at some point when they sign their contract, they then become an official kind of new starter within Workday. That, that triggers the uh, Azure Workday connector to synchronize that user or new user over to Azure AD, which is then written into on-premise AD using AAD Connect. Th that new user object is created. It, it's automatically disabled to start with, and it's in, a, it's in a special OU for kind of imported users. MIM picks up that object. So we, we recognize it's a new user. The new, st the new starter workflow runs. <coughs> And this, this is the area that we're currently implementing. So that, that will do things like add them to the, the sales distribution list. It will add them to the security group for Salesforce. We'll add them to the role, sorry, which is associated with the security group. Um, so the, the user ends up <coughs> in the Salesforce admin group within AD. That gets written back over to Azure AD. Here the Salesforce connector picks it up creates the license, sorry, creates the user within Salesforce, assigns the license, puts them into the correct role. User comes in on their first day, logs into uh, my apps using the corporate creden credentials that, that have been provided as part of their first day induction with our end user support team. They're able to click straight onto the Salesforce icon, which is already there for them, no other requests required. And they go through into Salesforce. 
with the correct level of access, ha happy user, will hopefully be a, a long-term just eater because they've had a really good onboarding experience. <coughs> Excuse me. So that, that's kind of how the whole, all, all of the, um, the, the steps like work together to, to create a nice seamless automation flow for, for our users. Um, so we've learned a few things along the way. Um, we're, we're not complete on this by, by any means. Um, you know, we've, we've gone, gone <coughs> going through the starters, movers, and, and, and levers kind of in order. So we're, we're currently focused on starters. Um, but what we have found is that it's really important to understand and optimize the process. So if you, if you try to automate a badly designed manual process, you end up with a badly designed automated process. So we've um, kind of spoken to a lot of our end user support team about how they actually um, operate the process in real life versus what's written down in the documentation. We, we've uh, identified that there's <coughs> probably a few steps that actually aren't required, um, either because we're changing the technology or because actually the business has moved on since that process was written and it's no longer necessary to, to do you know, step X. So we've got, we've got now a nice kind of simplified and streamlined process written down that we're able to automate. Um, that obviously requires some good communication back with the team to make sure that people are following the, the new process rather than the old one. And it's, it's, a, it's a more of a kind of continual <coughs> evolution really rather than just a, a, big, a big bang approach, as we say later. Um, automating one area, so automating our, the IT side of our new starter process also does tend to show up some potential weaknesses in other areas. So if, if you're going through an automation uh, project like this, you probably need to have some kind of discrete conversations with some other areas of the business. So, so what we found, for example, is that our HR process, which, which, which converts someone from onboarding to new user status within Workday, doesn't always happen in quite the time scale that we need it to for the IT side of that process to then be to run through and be, and be processed and be ready for the user's first day. Um, so we have to have a few words for the, with HR to, to make sure that they, they, they do things as, as quickly as possible. So it, it becomes one kind of joined up process rather than independent silo processes. So it's a good thing overall, but it is a little bit of kind of pain when you're, when you're bedding it in. Uh, the provisioning that we talked about, so the, the SaaS service provisioning and deprovisioning, it is um, really great. It's a little less supported than we would have liked to think kind of out of the box. So <coughs> we, th th there, are, th there is obviously the ability to do custom um, connectors and so on within Azure, but we're, we're hoping to use as much out, out of the box as possible because our team is not primarily a, de a development team. We're more kind of Microsoft engineers. Um, so uh, j just, just kind of do your research before you start. And if, 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 you, if you have a, a load of SaaS applications, have a look at the Azure uh, AD app gallery and see which features are supported for each application in terms of whether, whether provisioning is supported or if it's just a sign-on uh, application. Um, so it, yeah, it's a subset of those that are available with both the application supporting provisioning and Azure AD connector supporting provisioning as well. It's getting, it's growing you know, all the time, um, but it has to be supported at both ends. Um, as I said, don't, don't try and do it in a big bang. Take an incremental approach wherever you can. So we, we are, implementing parts of the of the process one at a time uh, to, to make sure we can test each thing <coughs> in isolation as much as possible and if there are any issues with it we don't kind of accidentally delete all of our users or all that kind of stuff or at least we do it in dev not in production um, finally SSO is is really really great we use it extensively but kind of think before you deploy it so because we uh, have our SSO based on ADFS. That's kind of a service which is hosted internally by, by my team. We don't necessarily want that to be the thing which stops our engineers from being able to fix a production incident. So our, our chat system um, and our alerting system are both not tied into single sign-on kind of intentionally. They have their own set of user accounts. Uh, we, are look at doing we are looking at doing provisioning actually for those, but not, um, not single sign-on. Because in the event of an outage on justeat.co.uk, not that it happens very often, um, we don't want our single sign-on to be the thing that stops the engineers from being able to fix it. Um, that would be a bad thing. We have had a few challenges along the way. Um, so getting to 100% attribute sync between Workday and Active Directory has turned out to be quite hard. And what I mean by that is that every user synchronizes from Workday into AD successfully 
and that every data attribute within those user objects within Workday and AD are the same. Uh, so there's, there's always a handful of users that aren't synchronizing properly. I think we've got to about 95% currently, which we think is kind of good enough for now as, as we're going through the project. Um, but there's always going to be issues with the data, such as you know someone's put a phone number within an email address field within Workday, or there's capital letters used instead of lowercase, all those kind of little, little things. So <coughs> you need to make sure you have a BAU process in place that allows you to feed those data change requests back to HR. So, so it's very much a kind of feedback loop. As you get data synchronized over, you, you can then send changes back to HR where, where you identify them. Uh, the Workday connector that we're using in Azure AD um, was fairly new towards the end of last year. So we, I think we we're one of the earliest customers with the ID experts to, to put that in place. Um, we have had a few, a few little issues with it along the way, um, a few stability issues where, where we've tried to change some settings and the whole thing has just stopped synchronizing. We've had to recreate it. Um, it's definitely improved and also the, um, the amount of stuff you can do through the GUI in, in Azure AD for that connector is also improving. So um, yeah, just, just be aware that if, if a connector is really new, you know, it, it's likely to still be developing on a, on a continual basis. So you may have a few issues and do your testing. Uh, as Brandon pointed out, there are some differences between on-premise AD and Azure AD. Um, Azure AD does not equal on-premise AD. Um, so an example of that is a limited support for nested groups within Azure AD. So nested groups are when you have one group as a member of another group. So we use that quite extensively with our roles that I talked about. So a role is just an AD group. And that, that AD group is then made a member of a security group for an application, for example. So that's nested groups. Um, <coughs> so we've had to do a bit, of, a bit of coding to kind of flatten that out when it gets written off into Azure AD. However, you get all the good Azure AD stuff um, to kind of compensate for it. So it's definitely worth using. Um, we also have a whole load of roles within Workday at the moment, uh, which are different roles in terms of their job title, but they are essentially doing the same job. So an example of that might be contact center agent, um, CC agent, customer care agent, customer support agent. They're probably the same team in the same call center, the same building, doing the same thing. However, um, job title has, has always been a free text field within Workday for us. So there's a whole um, kind of legacy of uh, jobs where the line manager has just you know, put in a title that's relevant to that person and it might be a different title for someone else even though they're doing the same thing. So we haven't actually come up with a way of getting around this yet. We just have a whole load of extra um, roles within AD where we have to uh, kind of duplicate the effort in, in profiling those. Um, we're, we're trying to come up with a way with HR that we can, we can update some of the job titles, um, but they get a little bit cross, understandably, if, if, we, if we ask them to update people's job titles without telling the users first and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, HR. Um, finally, um, manual intervention is still required in, in places. So uh, we, you, you can't automate everything. So for example, if someone comes along on their first day and says, oh, actually, I'd like to use my nickname in my email address, or I, you know, my first name's John, but I go by my middle name, um, the automation probably isn't going to pick that up because the, all, our, all of our rules are based on the username being first name dot last name. So you, you may still have to make a few changes manually, um, but by, by automating the majority of the standard use cases, you can get rid of a lot of that manual work. And, we, and we ha we're hoping to free up a lot of our end user, end user support time to be doing a lot more kind of valuable customer facing stuff than just going through starter lever processes and auditing those processes. So there have been a few challenges, but you know, it gives us some, some really, really good benefits and, uh, and we think it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to be doing. So we've improved our security and audit compliance. So our, our Chief Information secure, Security Officer and our Head of Internal Audit are both kind of key stakeholders on the project um, and they're really on board with what we're doing and they can see the benefits in terms of improving uh, kind of what we do from a security point of view. Definitely helps to improve the end user experience, especially for new starters. So you know, make that process as slick and as friction-free as you can, so it gets people productive more quickly, and it also is just a really nice experience for them. Uh, automation, as I said, it freeing, freeing up a lot of our support time, uh, so we can you can use that for more valuable things, and it also means that the business can continue to grow without us having to scale our in, our internal enterprise IT team at the same rate. So we like to maintain a lean enterprise IT team, so we can put the majority of our resources 
into developing Just Eat products and services. Um, we don't want to have to have a huge team just dedicated to doing access requests and, and um, yeah, new starter forms. Helps us to address GDPR. Don't, don't forget that applies to staff data as well as to customer data. And it also brings us a bit more in line with the kind of tech culture Just Eat. You know, we're a, we're a technical organization. We, the, the, the techies who run the platform and do all the development of the services, you know, love automation. Um, so, so the more we can automate, the more we, we kind of come, on, come in line with the company, with the rest of the, of the tech culture around, around developing the platform. Um, so it, it's definitely something that our developers can really kind of understand and, and are, I get a bit excited about, amazingly. Um, which is, you know, because it's automation, it's, it's taking out manual things, and ultimately it makes life easier for them as well. Um, I, I, I haven't got any slides about it, but for example, we've, we've put in something called Amazon Central Access for our developers to, to do identity management into our Amazon Web Services. And again, that's all around automation and um, making sure that, that it's kept as secure as possible. So but by, by releasing these kind of tools to the rest of our um, tech community, it's, it's a great opportunity to give them the tools and services that they need to, um, to be efficient in their jobs. So uh, that's it for me. I, I'm happy to answer any questions now, or obviously you can submit them on the, on the app as well. Um, I'm aware time is just about running out, but um, if there's any questions. Um, yes, so um, hardware rollout is something that isn't currently automated, but we, we are planning to work that into our onboarding process through Workday. So we're going to be adding the, the ability to choose your hardware before you join us, um, which will then tie into our finance system to purchase it automatically. In terms of license management, so that's um, the, the actual process of ordering licenses is still manual, so we have to have some kind of feedback to show how many users we got on Google, for example, and other, other systems. Um, but we are making sure that the, the amount of users who are licensed for a particular application are correct. Sorry. Any more questions? I think we're good. People obviously want their break. Cool. But, uh, thank you so much, Daniel. All right, thank you. Thank you.